and I started. So welcome everybody to today's eSports Research Colloquium. My name is Oliver Leis and I'm very happy to be joined by Michelle Payne, Eric Poch, um, John Brain for today's sessions. They are working as sport psychology practitioners in the field of esports. They have different perspectives, different experiences, some starting their journey, some being there for years. And I think they will uh, add a high value to today's session. Um, I was honestly really happy about this session today and I was also a bit nervous given um, that I think it can not only influence people that are currently working in esports, such as players, coaches, and sport psychologists or performance coaches, but also those who might be thinking about entering the field of esports. And today they might learn something about the joy of working in esports, challenges, benefits, and we will also be talking about some recommendations or suggestions that the speakers of today's sessions have for you. Um, as always, you're welcome to actively participate in today's session. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand using the included function. And I allow you to talk to the speakers and myself as well. So without further ado, I'd like to start the session with a brief introduction of the speakers, and then we focus on the joy, the challenges, the benefits, and possible recommendations. So. Michelle, I'd like you to start. Um, could you please introduce yourself, your background, where you're from, and um, what you are doing in the esports environment? Thanks, Ollie. Yes, I'm Dr. Michelle Payne. I work in Melbourne, Australia, and I've been a sports psychologist for maybe about 35 years. And I worked in traditional sports for most of that time, but also teaching at university for about uh, about 30 years as well, I suppose. And I, I felt like a bit of a dinosaur in my region. Um, I was one of the, well, I was the person that um, created a master's degree course in sports psychology back in 1992. And it allowed for the profession then to have a pathway to, to go. And so um, I felt like I've, I've done all I could in sports psychology and I was losing a bit of interest and I was still teaching at university. So I let my registration lapse. And about three and a half years ago, I was approached by a sports psychology company, Condor Performance, and they asked me to be a sports psychologist with them. And I, I agreed to that, but I had to renew my registration. At the same time, I had an organization in um, in Australia, one of the one of the top esports organizations. Actually, my son is a part owner of that one, and he uh, he had a team that said we need to work with a sports psychologist. And my son said, yep, I know one of them. So uh, that's how I got involved in working with um, a, a CS team back in 2019. Sounds like a great journey, but I disagree. You're not a dinosaur. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Eric, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think this uh, session will be, will be uh, a joyful experience for all of us. Um, my name is Eric Poch. Um, I've been a sport psychologist um, since last year because I finished my um, my master's degree in sport psychology in Berlin. I live in Germany and uh, I've been um, coaching teams and individuals in eSports for the last approximately for the last two years. And yeah, um, I mostly work with uh, League of Legends teams. Um, I also love football. I've been playing football for the last 13 years, at least 13 years, yeah. And besides that, um, I'm currently Diamond 2 in League and uh, I hopefully get Masters this season. <laughs> and yeah, um, with that, I will give it over to John. <laughs> I don't pay law, so I have no idea what you just talked about there. <laughs> um, no, yeah, but my name is John Brain. I'm from Belgium. Um, I'm currently a professional doctorate candidate at the University of Portsmouth. Um, so I'm both conducting research in esports and I'm uh, currently in the process of being registered with uh, the HCPC in the UK to become an accredited sports psychologist. Um, I'm also the co-founder of a sports psychology company called Mastering the Mind, where we work both in traditional sports and esports. 
Uh, we also host the Sports Psychology Podcast, where we interview traditional sports athletes and esports players and coaches about how they cope with the mental demands of competing at the elite level. Um, and in terms of like my gaming experience, uh, I play a variety of games such as Overwatch, FIFA, COD, uh, you name it. So, uh, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Thank you very much. Um, I'd continue with you, John. How how did you enter esports as a sports psychologist? So it actually started during the summer between my bachelor's and my master's. Um, and I was already thinking about what research I wanted to do for my master's. And I came across uh, Isma Pedraza's paper, um, his systematic review, where he talked about sort of like how sports psychology is applicable to the esports space. And then something sort of clicked in my mind. Um, and I thought this could be a fantastic uh, piece of rights, given the lack of research. Uh, in the space um, and I also have a passion for esports or sports injuries so I decided to sort of combine my two passions so like sports injuries and esports and do like a, a research piece for my masters uh, so that's how I sort of entered esports um, I then decided I wanted, I wanted to get some applied experience within the field uh, during my masters so I joined G Science, who were at the time uh, an esports company providing multidisciplinary support to, to different teams across the world and I was working as sort of like a content creator for them so producing mm. e sort of like esports psychology uh, pieces carousels um, and different things like that so um, and then I couldn't obviously practice at that time as I was in my master's so fast forward to finishing my master's and starting my prof doc uh, that's when I sort of entered the space um, had a few gigs here and there, so working mostly on an individual basis and so not really being embedded within an org yet. Um, but I would say, I would say sept last September is when I really started uh, working within the space. So I joined Lions Grid, who's an esports org, um, London based. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like my journey. Um, so yeah, complete opposite as to Michelle. Uh, he's a dinosaur here in this call, so uh, <laughs> I'm a very, <laughs> let's say, baby in the in the space. So, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's nice to have you, um, and adding your fresh views on the field, and I think it will add great value. Um, since you addressed it, one day I I'd love to hear that my paper influenced some practitioners in their decisions. Not 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 a huge decision as yours, but Small decisions would would be enough for me. Uh, Michelle, we talked about your your journey. You got approached by um, Condor Performance. Mm -hmm. um, great journey as well. And Eric, how did you enter esports as a practitioner? Yeah, um, we in esports we would say R and Jesus helped with that a bit. So um, I had a friend back in in school um, who I short league to, and we we didn't get in touch um, after school. Um, but he eventually eventually became a coach and one day he just asked me to help him with tryouts because we just um, played together and I said yeah sure I help you with tryouts so it's, it's like a training a training for new players that may join in, into into his organization and I helped him out and then I asked yeah well I well I'm actually studying some psychology maybe I can be a little bit of help and yeah, that's what I did. Um, we played two seasons. Yeah, we played two seasons <laughs> together. I got recommendations, references, get got into the bubble and grew nationally. And um, yeah, and yeah, right now, three months ago, I started my um, my business mental diff, and yeah, it's starting to pick up a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you started with a small step of coaching one individual, and then you you grew to uh, own business and being recognized by the community, I would say. At least I know you before we we met a long time ago. Yeah, yeah you were there from the start, kind of. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but since you addressed it, would you briefly introduce your, your Mental Diff organization? Yeah, no problem. So um, Mental Diff, what, what do I mean by that? Like, my, my cat phrase is gap your opponent, and that might mean that I mean by just mentally having the advantage, like being prepared. And my big three things I'm working on with mental diff is personality development, um, 
performance enhancement and mental well-being and yeah i think that's enough for now <laughs> yeah. but if you have if you're interested you can find me on twitter of course <laughs> yeah um michelle and john do you also work on those aspects or do you think there's an additional aspect that you work on with your practitioner work or is there something that you don't work on that eric mentioned michelle would you start um not much the same sort of areas as well i think yeah so yeah and john yeah similar i think the piece that stands out to me is sort of like that identity work so helping sort of players realize that they're sort of more than just players that's something i really try to promote like through my work um so we talked about football like mm -hmm. that's for example in the academy in the academy system um there's a high emphasis on you know all or nothing you have to make it you know you have to be committed um and sometimes this can have negative effects with regards to that identity so players really only identify themselves as academy players that's sort of similar within the esports space you know the commitment the time needed your identity can be solely being an esports player so that's sort of like a piece to add to eric is like yeah. that's a big part of what i do um, yeah. yeah so what i'm hearing is that all of you work on the whole toolkit of sport psychology is that correct that's correct yeah great that's that's lovely um and i had the question for you how does a normal day as a sport psychologist or trainee in sport psychology uh, looks like? And Michelle, you, you sent me an image for that. I, I will share it now and you can start answering the question. Is that okay? Sure. Um, I've sent you a, 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 a what looks like a, a week. So it's a bit scary. Um, so this is, this is the, the week we're in right at the moment. And I don't normally, all the yellow ones are, officials so uh, you know competition days tournament days and the green ones are scrims so i've just come off a really heavy couple of days of different teams i work with seven different teams and uh at pro level and so i've got an aussie cs team that were, was competing first up and then i've got a chinese cs team a female chinese cs team in asia and i have work in um, north america with an org that has three different teams. I work with their Apex and Halo and League of Legends collegiate level teams. And I've just started working with an Indian Valorant team. So I see them two nights a week. I see my Chinese team once a week. Um, in the mornings, I divide my time up with the, my North American team teams. And uh, yeah, you see that <laughs> Sunday I have a block there where we sleep with a question mark because <laughs> I, I did an all-nighter on Sunday night. So I'm feeling a little bit weary, but um, I work full time in esports. So this this would look similar as a week in terms of um, you know weekdays. Definitely, it looks like that. And weekends, um, I would have Saturday mornings, probably Saturday nights off, and Sundays is often a competition day. So yes, yeah, it's, it's many I have Saturday after uh, evenings off usually. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty busy. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this insight. Um, so you're working with seven different teams. And can you say, given that you have one Indian Valorant team, for example, how do you support them doing a scrim? Uh, so, so, so yeah, yeah. A, lo a lot of my work is um, listening to comms. That's my, that's my special area. I'm listening to comms to see how my teams are talking to each other and whether they're giving information as clearly as they possibly could. Uh, I'm looking to hear, you know, how, you know, team culture type issues that everyone's quite happy with what's going on and um, that if there are any issues, they get sorted out right away. I think that's one of the benefits of esports is that you can, in in comparison to traditional sports is what I'm thinking of, is in esports you can sort of immediately fix things when there are problems but in traditional sports you know you might be physically and geographically removed from where your players are when they're training yeah. and you might hear about problems but you don't actually see them happening so the immediacy of esports is something that's really attractive to me yeah um one question that i need to ask given that i was not familiar with the term comms can you briefly oh describe? communication Thanks. so yes everything, everything you hear so when I stumbled across that word, I wasn't familiar with it and I had to look it up, but yeah, oh, thanks sorry. for your explanation. <laughs> um, Eric, 
how does a week for you look like? Is it similar to what um, Michelle just described? Um, well, no, 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 because I'm not full time in um, um, esports psychology. Um, I, but but when I was, I usually don't coach them the whole day. I give like 90 minutes, maybe 180 minutes interventions. Um, for example, if there's something big to discuss on one one on one day. Uh, but yeah, also I join scrims, um, listen to comms, that's a big part. And also um, intervene or prepare coaches for the talk in between games. That's also a huge thing because it's really crucial how to how to impact your team between between two games. Like, um, do you do you say, hey, OK, guys, lay back, we got this. Or do you say, guys, we have to fix something now? That's it's really and um, I know that from from football as well. And that's something the coaches came up to me as well to to how to deal with the situation and yeah it was also a lot of fun but that's that's what i usually do when i work with teams and when i work with individuals yeah it's well that's really individual right <laughs> as it as it states yeah thank you um i have a follow-up question and the more we talk the more we get into detail so um please don't stress me <laughs> um the speakers the audience um just just a joke a joke um so eric when we access your twitter page um the pin post is um of someone talking about his experience with you as a sports psychologist and i think it greatly addresses what you just addressed within your schedule um and he describes you as someone who's taking the role of a more passive individual who provides stimuli from time to time could you provide the rational um, for that? Why you do this or you choose this approach? Yeah, yeah. That's um, if I if I see it fit, I I take that laid back position. And what I mean by that is, um, our our major in in Berlin, um, he works a lot with morphology, morphologic psychology, and it's not not very common in psychology, but in sports psychology as well. He he kind of um, developed it, it himself and morphology stems from depth psychology, gestalt psychology and also holistic psychology. And because I'm also a systemic coach, it has a very, a, um, a very similar um, understanding of psychology. And in this, in the, um, in this method, what you would usually do is um, um, watch out for gestalten so um, like you watch the team as a as a whole being and see what will happen i could i could um i could give a, a brief example of what's happened for example so we had uh, when i walked in a, a, with the team two two years ago um they weren't they weren't performing as well and so my my coach came came up to me and said like we have to we have to do something we have to fix it and i said okay okay i will talk to the team i talked to them and they said they don't didn't like the the training it wasn't as impactful they wanted more training and um, it was too late back and i said okay um let me see and i sat down with them three to four hours and they just discussed the whole time but they never talked about the actual problem, which was communication, it wasn't the training that was bad, it was the communication. And they talked straight through for three hours. And then they wanted to talk to the coaches um, the what they would change about the, the schedule, the training schedule. And the coaches said, OK, we're going to fix that. They never changed anything, not not any training. But um, I what I got from the discussion, the three hour long discussion was just having to express themselves and getting some steam off maybe and telling the stuff like we we want to be in charge and uh, have to say something that gave them the freedom and after that they they won every single game and my coach came up to me like you're genius what 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 did you to <laughs> them and i said like i i didn't do that much to be honest and i i feel like that it was really effective back then and my my professor at the university he worked with um the bundesliga like with top teams and so 
I, I want to share this in, in eSport psychology as well. And for as well, as of right now, it worked really, really well with teams. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to me, it sounds like something that Michelle recently tweeted about. Um, she she expressed the self-determination theory or the use of it in eSports. Um, basically, the theory summarizes that one needs um, autonomy, a feeling of autonomy, competence, competence and relationship. relationship. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, to feel motivated or to experience satisfaction. And could you elaborate on that, Michelle? Uh, well, I, I want to pick out a few things, maybe just touching on what Eric was talking about. Um, I, I get my teams to do a debrief at the end of each scrim, and it's a written document that I use where each player will have a, a line assigned to them and they write in some notes. Oh, sorry, some, some well, I... Depends if I do a long form or a short form. The short form says, how did the team perform? So a number out of 10, 10 is the best. So team performance and their own performance. And then I get them to write a note. So in the notes column, they're writing about what they thought went wrong and what they thought went right. And by having every every person on the team talk about, uh, from their perspective, what, what went right and what went wrong, uh, without interruption, then everyone gets a chance to speak and we get we fix up all the problems so if you know it, it's okay if it's um if we're winning it's, it's a it's, it's a quick and easy debrief but if we're losing i don't want people to finish the night by you know having a sleepless night and wondering if they're going to be kicked off the team because you know they might feel they're responsible for the mistake so we talk it all out and and we see that every single person is contributing to the success of the team and they're all invested in fixing the problem and so uh, the debrief document has saved my teams numerous times <laughs> um uh in every team i've worked in pretty well you know it stops the team from imploding when you know that everyone's working hard i think that's one of the things that that blows teams apart is if you know players suddenly suspect there's a teammate who's not pulling their weight um it needs to be addressed and the, the debrief document is one of those things that can address those so just having having a chance to speak or actually even making people speak because some players don't want to speak, but it's important we hear from everybody uh, and they get used to it eventually. But uh, the debrief document is like the number one tool I would use, I'd say. Yeah. What you just expressed is uh, also supported by qualitative research um, that players really dislike um, if they perceive other players not being as motivated, not caring as right. much about performance and not being able to communicate in a good way. Is there yeah. something you would like to add to that discussion, John? Um, no, yeah, just on, on that last point, I think having sort of shared values and shared goals is like a really important part of like our role, at, especially when we come into a team. So that's sort of like a good way to mitigate, I think, these frustrations. If everyone's on the same page from the, mm. start, from the start, if everyone's held accountable on behaviors that don't align with the values that they set at the start, then it's a good way to get you know, a shared understanding, shared goals, and shared direction. So yeah, but yeah, my schedule's pretty boring, so. <laughs> Why? <laughs> No, it's just well, obviously I'm not as integrated within the team. So, yeah, I don't have like a lovely calendar like Michelle. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think that's fine. <laughs> um, bef before we we miss that part, um, there was a question from the audience. Um, I think it referred to something that you said, Michelle. How do you know what needs to be communicated? Okay, so um, let me let me explain. I don't do I don't play the games myself, so. Oh. But I have had experience of listening to like to thousands of hours of my teams playing. So I know that um, in first person shooters, we need to know, you know, what the enemy is doing. How do we, how do we get space? Uh, we need to talk to each other about what utilities we have in terms of flashes we can throw or um, alts or whatever. There's, there's stuff that we have to do in game and, and talk to each other. So I need to make sure that my players are saying what, what they are hearing and seeing and doing themselves, um, what they like, what they can see the enemy doing, uh, the timing of things, just any information. Um, I guess, yeah, 
I, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. So you know, you know, you know, at the beginning of the rounds, whether you're meant to be listening for information so that you can give it back to your teammates, or whether you're meant to be saying, "Okay, I'm watching this area," or "I'm leaving this area." Everyone in the team needs to know what's happening, so the plans can be made in the mid round and the end round. Do you also pick up on things like tone and the way? Like, oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. As well. So is that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm listening. To, yeah, listening to all those sort of things. But also, you know, are they are they giving the information in the right way? And I guess you know something I've picked up from traditional psychology. You know, the cocktail party effect. If you if you are in a room and you're hearing like a million voices you know, all bubbling along at this one time and across the other side of the room, someone says your name, then you'll prick up your ears and you'll try and listen to see what the message is. You know, who, someone wants to talk to me. What is, what's the message? And in a team game, like, you know, in an esports game, I tell them that if they give their name at the start of the information, that the person will listen and hear their name and then they'll hear what the message is as opposed to giving the message and then the person's name they hear their name at the end, but they've missed the message. So just using that sort of idea that, you know, give the name first, then the message, and it'll be much quicker. You won't have to repeat yourselves quite so often. Yeah, absolutely agree. And here, we, I think we need to clarify for some. Um, and you by name, you need, mean the real name. I, I get all my teams to use their real name. Um, I have a lot of opposition from teams initially who say, no, no, we're all known by our in-game names. We want to stick with that. And I say, no, we're actually doing it for a reason because I want my teams to feel very close to each other and I want them to be able to respond very quickly to their names. And they tend to do that for their first name as opposed to their in-game name. And I want to separate too. Um, I, want to, I want the the people on the inside of the team to know each other by their first names and everyone outside of that to be known by the in-game name. And that's fine. It's, that's that separation so that you know who to listen to on game day. You're listening to your team members and everyone else is on outside of that circle, outside of that bubble. So it, it's important. So I, I find I get an opposition to start with. Um, I'm starting with a couple of new teams who are dragging their feet a little bit and they're, they're not keen. But I tell them after six weeks, you know, if you don't like it, uh, you can go back. But if you stick out for six weeks, no one wants to go back because everyone really feels strongly bonded together. And it's a very important concept. Yeah. And we get back to the self-determination and relatedness. And to get back to the question from the audience once again, um, there's a follow-up question. Given that it's difficult to handle um, five screens being available, available from each player in real time, how do you deal with that? Maybe this is something that all... Uh, speakers can address, but uh, maybe we start with you, Michelle. Uh, yeah, so I, I sometimes, um, with my Rainbow Six team, if they put up their screens, I record all, all five of their team, all five of their screens at one go, and so I can see where everyone is looking and what they're doing, and hear the comms at the same time. I OBS all my matches, so I've, I've got recordings of, um, of this, so that if you know there's a dispute later and says, you know, why didn't you do such and such? Oh, I heard this. You can you can sort out a dispute pretty quickly by just checking the comms to see that you know what it is that were they looking at the right thing or were they saying the right thing at that time. Uh, but sometimes I get a chance to uh, not be in the game because there's a coach taking up the coach sl slot, and so I get his perspective usually to him. Usually uh, get his perspective, and I only get the one um, the the one you know whatever he's flicking onto is watching and that's fine too but I prefer to actually have like every player's screen up if I can most of, a lot of my teams do that yeah it's pretty interesting Eric do you also do that yeah I did that um, like twice before and it was really helpful but what what usually happens is that we 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 are normally on Discord right and everyone shares their screens and at least one bot lane person and everyone else so then then we can swap and, and just i got a big new screen and then i just put up everything and i can see see everyone but i think it's not it's not that important to me as of right now to really see what what is happening to everyone um but just listening to the comms is more important to me yeah john yeah, similar here, You're just hopping in the channel, everyone shares their screen. Um, 
and yeah just i'm sort of on eric's sort of wavelength like listening i'm more listening than watching so i am too yeah yeah it's it's, hard it's to only in, it's only in the post match that I, maybe I want to go back and have a look more than anything else. But uh, yeah, my my attention is mostly on listening to the comms. You're right. For sure. I think it's really important, like it, to watch. This comes in handy when like there's something crucial happening. Uh, for example, in League of Legends, you have the junglers. They have smite, and it, the enemy jungle, the, they also have smite, and if our jungler misses his smite, but the jungler's um, enemy jungler doesn't. Like that's a crucial point. And if you can connect this like misplay with the comms, you can uh, you can hear like sighs and and maybe some flame. Some people even mute themselves to get off steam maybe and not get this into the team. And then it's really crucial to watch out and uh, look for the exact moments. But, but if you if they are in the flow, um, in the speaking flow, I call it, because usually what happens is they come into a flow and everyone just talks and it never cuts off. And if something bad happens, everyone stops talking, and then we have to restart the motor. But then we get going again. Yeah, I think both both approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. But I believe and. I'm not working in, as in the applied field, but I believe it gets more important to watch individual plays when we consult individuals in contrast to the teams. But yeah, pretty pretty interesting. Um, we touched on a lot of, I'd say, negatively toned aspects in esports, but to keep the audience and to keep the the listeners here, um, I'd move on with what. The joy of esports. What what really uh, motivates you to work in esports? What what is it that sparks joy when you do your work? Um, John, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Yes. Um, I think the first one for me is sort of that youthness piece. So there's a lot. Well, through my experience, there's a lot of banter, a lot of memes thrown around and stuff like that. So like, I kind of relate to that because that's sort of my generation. Um, so that's something I really appreciate about the space. Sometimes it can be negative though, but we won't go into the negatives because we're sticking to positives. Um, the other thing is the openness as well. I think players tend to be really curious about sports psychology and our work. Um, from my experience, once again, they haven't been so close to it, despite you know the stigma that's attached to you know talking about you know your your feelings, your emotions, etc. So, and I think especially players are curious about your previous experience working in traditional sports as well. I think they're really hungry to know what they're doing, you know, in, in that area of performance and trying to apply it to themselves. Um, so yeah, that openness piece. And Michelle sort of mentioned this already, sort of that flexibility. So being able to, um, you know, work with people from around the world, you know, online. Um, it's, it's like a privilege, I guess, through our work. You know, we're able to do our work behind the computer screen. So um, that's really fun, you know, interacting with different cultures, people from different parts of the world. Um, so yeah, those are, I think the three that sort of stick out to me for now. Um, I'm sure I'll think of some, so yeah. Thank you. Um, Michelle? I've had a 30 year career as a university lecturer and I like to think that I was kept young by talking to all my students because I love working with them. And so for me, it's the ability to positively influence uh, men and women in esports uh, to you know, just be be better versions of themselves. Um, and oh, I, I hate I hate admitting it, but you know, being a mother type figure, <laughs> I don't I don't like to be called that. But um, usually, you know, I've got a lot of experience in life, and so I can offer lots of things, uh, lots lots of handy hints to them in not just in esports, but in relationship issues and all sorts of things. Would you, would you say that belongs to personal development or is this something that is different? Yeah, personal development, but also um, we, we had um, like we had a, a Valentine's Day not long ago and a couple of my players were in a little bit of strife with their partners for various reasons. And so they'll often share with me, you know, this, they've got a, a few problems here. <laughs> and they share what's on the screen and they say, 
what does, what's this mean? <laughs> so I speak fluent girl, so yeah. it's quite handy from that point of view. <laughs> yeah. I see. I see. Eric? Well, well, I think I'm a gamer at heart, so for me it's just the high, the high place. Um, I, I've played a lot of soccer but um, and also competitive, but the best hype moments were all in eSports with my um, pre-made team um, or with my team that I coached. And it's just so, so good to see a team synergizing well and, get, and growing and getting together. And what's usually the case in eSports, at least in League of Legends, is that um, after one split or one season, the team just breaks apart and gets into another team, hoping that they get um, more money out of a new team or get into a higher division. But um, after one season, well, that's maybe not all because of me, but I think part of it is um, they 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 said they're only going to play if they are all five. And that happened two, two splits in a row. And it was really fun and a good time. And um, so like this growing aspect of it and working together as a team um i think that's the best part of it for me yeah can i add something sorry ali um we've, we've all survived covid region so you know being online has been really helpful from that point of view but thank goodness that lands are coming back because that's that's the enjoyable part isn't it just being with your team and and having the opportunity to actually meet in real life that's something I'm I'm looking forward to with a lot of my my teams. I haven't met them all yet, so I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I I agree. Um, it was insane. Uh, seeing or experiencing the dream hack in Jen Köping, Sweden, last year. John, you're yeah. nodding. Do you have something to add to to meeting real life? Yeah, I agree with Michelle on on your point, Oli. And also another thing that I thought of was that sort of opportunity to pioneer because. Mm. That's a, yes. that's a really interesting one in terms of like the research and the applied space as well. So I think that's what gets me motivated as well is so that, you know, we're, we're pioneering, you know, and other people in this school as well. So, yeah. 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 I, I agree. So we have eight different aspects that you enjoy about um, working in esports. And I think you all nodded when the others were speaking. So it might be something that all of you share. Um, if not, correct me. So we have flexibility. We have um, working in an open environment that is also new, um, which the new environment brings the opportunity to be a pioneer or to pioneer. We have personal development. We have personal support, which was addressed by Michelle. We have experiencing team growth and also meeting in person. And I think these are some aspects that especially meeting in real life or um, personal support is something that maybe not everyone expects when we talk about esports in contrast to traditional sports. And I think it's it's uh, pretty important to emphasize on that and also work on these issues. Uh, not issues, but also work on those aspects beside common issues. Yeah. Um, talking about common issues, what do you think are common issues that you are experiencing in esports, in contrast to the positive things we just talked about, is there something, someone that wants to start? Oh, sorry, Ali, I didn't understand the question. Tell me again, please. What, what are common issues that you are experiencing when working with players and teams or coaches? I think the first one's probably going to be, you know, the, the the main reason I see a lot of players probably initially might be to do with issues around. Um, uh, anxiety and depression type ones in terms of clinical type things, but in the game, the anxiety stuff, how it how it affects their ability to shoot or to um, play the game. Um, a lot of, a lot of my players are keen to know have some strategies around that. Be a, a common sort of issue, I imagine. Yeah, thank you. Do you agree, Eric and John? Yeah. So um, performance anxiety is a big thing. I've seen it over and over again, but by far the most um, the most common issue. And when I ask, maybe so sometimes um, orgs come to me and ask for like a bit of a workshop or a little presentation. And when they ask their players what it should be about, they always say it's it should be about tilt, man. How can I manage that? It's always about tilt. <laughs> and 
Yeah, that's why I will, I will give a workshop about Hilton in the near future with a colleague. But also other common issues are like team team dynamics, as a complications, discussions, um, and also mediating between team and players, um, uh, team and staff. So, for example, if they have too much pressure from, from up top, because um, there are also many um, orgs that aren't uh, based in, um, in esports. For example, we have a big discounter a supermarket um, that is in that just just joined esports and they have no idea what esports is, is about. So there are many issues get up about communication, yeah. and also team building is also a huge part of it. And I I got some ways to get around, even though it's online, and I'm constantly testing out new new things that I encounter on my way. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the workshop on Tilt. Is everyone able to join the workshop or is it just a closed session? Um you will you will get it. Um when you when you follow me on Twitter you will get it. And it's it's open to everyone. Okay. Thank you. I will post the Twitter links or handles in the chat and also below the video recording. Um John, is there anything beside performance anxiety, tilt, team development, uh, or team dynamics that you experienced as an issue? Yeah. So the one I would add to that is sort of that work-life balance playing, you know, and sort of finding a balance because obviously there's a huge sort of grind culture within the esports space in general. So it's really about, I guess, reframing grinding and sort of implementing different things when, within grinding. So it's not only about playing, but it's also about, you know, self-care, recovery, also analyzing performance so watching VOD reviews. So actually not always having to play, but incorporate different aspects within grinding. Um, yeah. Not taking grinding away because you have to sort of, it's part of, you know, the, the context, the culture, but it's just reframing it, incorporating yeah. different things. So yeah, that's, a, that's another thing. Yeah. I think we, we touched on that. Um, the common issues that you are working on when we start this session, um, the broad toolkit of sport psychology. And we have some questions getting into the chat box. Um, and I think importantly, all of those aspects are interrelated. So when we have an issue with team dynamics, it might lead to under recovery or also uh, worries about performance and other aspects. And I'd start with, for example, team dynamics. Is there something that you experience is working quite well when you support teams and trying to achieve better team cohesion? Please just start. Whoever wants yeah, absolutely. to take the question. So were you going to show that other that other um slide of mine that I sent to you, Ollie? Were you going to do that in this one? Or otherwise I'll put the link for the Twitter that I, I it was put, based on. You can start. I, I I open it. Wait a second. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at the the self determination theory. You know, whenever someone's talking about, you know, setting the right motivational climate, I'm looking to see, you know, how how to make the team feel more bonded and stronger together. I think that if players, you know, I'm not someone who likes to have the rah rah type um, messages. That's not my my style at all. But by doing all the stuff behind the scenes and setting it for you know, making a good culture that way. I think that's motivating that if you know the players are playing for each other um, and wanting to do their best, that, that, that sort of takes care of the motivation aspect. Yeah, I took some time. I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean this one. That's the one I was thinking of. So uh, if, I, if I'm sort of preparing my, because I get a chance to work with my teams, like I'm there constantly. <laughs> So uh, I'm not called in for, you know, giving one or two sessions um, as, as needed. So I'm, I'm there constantly. So I'm always monitoring team climate in this way by um, making sure, yeah, we're looking for light banter, having fun together, being open and honest. Um, if there are things that are coming up that, you know, issues for them, I can, I can address them straight away all those sort of things that I'm doing sort of behind the scenes, like juggling, it's like a, like a, um, a duck on the, on the lake, you know, the, they look serene on the lake, but their legs are pummeling furiously. It's the same thing. You sort of at, behind the scenes, you're making sure all these things are sort of put into place so that uh, 
a team can be as cohesive as possible. That's that's how I work anyway. Yeah. Is it different from what you are doing, John and Eric? Thank you, Michelle. Well, I, I think it's, well, the self-determination theory is a really common one. And um, as I said before, I'm a systemic coach. And the systemic approach is also really about giving the self-determination to the player and figuring out for themselves what they want to do. So I don't want to be like, um, like a teacher saying, you have to do it like this because that's the result. And also all the coaches are doing that already. So I'm not the one. And with, so I just want to give them the right questions to ask themselves and they are gonna figure out the way in, in which they want to perform or, or, or go on or maybe even quit um, esports. I don't know um, because it's, it's an open discussion and it's also the, the, the goal is also open. So I don't set any, um, any frame around it. And also with the morphological approach I, I um, touched on earlier, those are ones that, that, that worked with team dynamics the best to me. Yeah. Similar to Eric in that um, I, I like to empower the, the players and the coaches within, like the, for example, the session and encourage them to, I, didn't, I sort of mentioned that at the start, but I, I love values work. So really help or encouraging them to come up with the values they value as a team and common goals that they want to work towards so really like i said at the start making them sort of accountable on those and then finding committed actions and behaviors that align with that value um i feel like yeah I, I, I've, I've loved doing that type of work and maybe to reinforce that to put that into practice you could find like you could think of scenarios difficult scenarios that they may encounter in game out of game and help or encourage them to say okay you've you've identified this value how are you going to respond using those values to this scenario for example so that could be like an addition within the session that you could do it's like to practice uh using those values yeah i think that also gets us back to michelle's papers that she that she published on twitter the last couple of days because we're talking about the intrinsic motivation so we want to figure out what's actually the intrinsic way of the person so so what I experience is some people just want to play for fun and some want to play for winning. Um, so my question would be to you two or maybe you three, um, how can you like integrate the, the shared common goals um, for the team, but also the individual goals that may not be um, the same as the team goals? How can you implement them? I'm trying to think of a scenario where my my players have different goals, like in, different individual goals to the team ones. I can't think of a situation where that happens. Do you um, have an example, Eric? So I've experienced people like, oh, like that's going to be my last split. Like I'm going to retire after that split. And some people on my team just um, getting into the scene and um, want to start their, their, their career. So if you have one player that's like, oh, I'm just going to do my um, last splits, so I'm not giving it all at my all, that that's, that can be pretty harmful to the to the whole team and the, and the splits because they have different goals in mind. Maybe you could identify that player's individual value. So for example, let's say loyalty is one of them. What does loyalty look like in terms of like practice, let's say? Even if his goal isn't or his value, they're not aligned with the team, he can maybe use his individual value and maybe sort of find a way to integrate it within that team value, I guess. Um, but yes, it's an interesting question. Do you have an idea, Eric? Or Well, I, I, I got around it all the time until now, but I think it could crash any day. Um, so it's, it may be, it may be a discussion that's, that's, that shouldn't be like, um, dug under. So but until now I was fine, but I think it, it can be scary. Just 
just to provide an example to my previous point. So for example, in traditional sports, I'm working with a footballer who seems to have lost sort of um, respect with for his head coach in terms of like the tactics, the decisions he make. But we work together on finding and identifying his values as a player, as a person. And I took that loyalty example. So he was still able to, you know, do what the coach asked him on the pitch, but without having maybe that shared agreement and shared understanding with the coach, he was still able to act within his values and do what he was asked, but it's, it's because it was in line with his value that he identified. So whether it's loyalty to his family, friends, etc., he was able to use that, but in his football career. So that's the sort of idea um, I was going along with that. I really like that approach, Sean. Um, is it from the Keegan book? No, it wasn't. The, it was a different book. Yeah. Don't don't care about that. Um, sorry, Michelle. Do do you have another idea? Uh, no, I'm out of ideas. Sorry, Ollie. <laughs> That's fine. That's absolutely fine. I think it's is not a common issue that that one faces that they have different goals that are differentiating from each other a lot I, most I, of all it could be about sorry. performance sorry i was going to say it's important for teams to all have shared ambitions or the same level of ambition um but usually all the teams i work with that they all want to win and they all want to play really well and we're only thinking like one split or one you know, one we're not thinking like years into the future where because esports is not like that, it's very volatile. So we're just thinking of the, you know, from now until the world championships or whatever, how long that is, six months, nine months, whatever. That's that's the span of time we're thinking about. And everyone is fully committed to that. So um I in in the one in the teams that I've worked with, I don't see differences. Sorry, is what I wanted to say. Sorry, I think about that. No, thanks for adding that uh, perspective. Yeah, what what I wanted to say, I I think having having values or talking about player strength, uh, will be a good thing to to incorporate individual goals and and common goals. Um, now I forgot where I wanted to go with that. Sorry, now, <laughs> I, I see. No, it's my my issue, not yours. Um. So we we talked about different aspects: tilt, performance, anxiety. And we can spend a lot of hours talking about an approach to deal with that or to manage those issues. But I th I think I remember a question from the audience was about how do we make sure that all players within a team pay attention to what we do? For example, when we enter uh, esports as a sport psychologist or we get into a new team, trying to support this team, maybe John, you are the best uh, to answer that question, given that you are... Um, just about to start your journey as a sport psychologist, a long journey, hopefully. Um, how can we make sure that all players that voluntary or that are forced forced to join your sessions, how do we make sure that they really pay attention and that they want to work on certain issues, that they value your approaches? You kill them off, don't you, if they don't agree with you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what works for me. <laughs> I think this is sort of a challenge that I face coming into the space is that um, there's a multiple things that I uncover, but I guess to answer your first question is my approach is not really being forcing players to come to your sessions. For example, I think the best way for, to encourage players to come into like one-to-one -one sessions is to do team sessions. Um, to show them that there are things that we can help with. It's more of like education. How can we help, et cetera? I think that's maybe the piece that's missing is what or what do we do? Um, how can we do it? Um, so sort of having like that introductory workshop when you enter a new team, I think is really important. Um, for example, like one of the teams I've worked with, I came into the team. I wasn't really introduced by, you know, the organ organization leaders, et cetera. This is also an important point. You need to have them behind you to support you. Um, and so this com this created confusion and the player approached me to help him with like wrist pain. Um, so there was a, really a mismatch of what my role was coming into the organization. So I think it, it's also the responsibility of the org leaders that hire you 
to back you up as well and to encourage the players also to seek your support etc so um yeah just because it's from top down at the end of the day you know um I, there's a lot I've, I've said a lot of things at once there. i don't know if it made sense but i hope it sort of answers your question um yeah just i'm working with the players that want to work with you i think it also um just yeah i'm against sort of forcing um and if they see that you're working well or you know that player might be speaking to the other player who doesn't want to and say yeah i've got i'm doing this with john etc etc have it go try have a go with him that might encourage him to then uh, like in the slot, like a one to one. So, so, so you'd said appropriately introducing yourself and the practice. Yeah. Um, that, sorry. Yeah, that that contracting period and setting expectations, etc., is something that I completely sort of skipped within my first experience working in the in a team. But it's it's key. It's so important. Um, yeah. yeah. It's time well invested, I think. Um, and doing a good job. Exactly. Just spread the word of sport psychology and then other team members might be willing to um, get involved in your service. Okay. Um, Michelle, do you have... I dazzle my teams with with um, a document that I've written that, so, that says this is why I'm successful and this is how I work. And Usually, usually that's impressive enough for them to want to pay attention to what I've got to say because they all the teams that I work with they all want to improve and they're prepared to do whatever it takes. So I don't have a problem with motivating players to come to my sessions or um, it it just it happens because they want to improve. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it'll be handy. I think it's something I recommend to to everybody to have a have a document to say. You know, if you're if you're looking for work, this is this is who I am. This is how I work. This is my experience. Um, and and allow allow you know document your successes and allow that to speak for you as well. Yeah. I I just want to stress that point from John. Um, if the if the coach is like not really interested in you or isn't. If he's not really sure if he of if you are really bringing any benefits to the team, then why should any of the players have the have the have a, a, another view? Because like the players, firstly looking um, at the coach, and if the coach says, "Well, he is this guy. He he wants to help us, but I don't know really how." Ask him himself. They they're not gonna like have the have the impact. And but if 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 players come to come to me because the coach says so um, and they're not really interested in working with me. Um, I figure out um, if they are, first of all, I just want to figure out if there anything, if there's nothing, okay, that's fine. Like, I don't want to like manipulate them into working with me, but I, I want to like see if there's anything that's, that's maybe, that's maybe beneficial to work on and, and if they see, yeah, that's actually a thing I would work on, then yeah, sure, clear, we can make that go. Thank you very much. I, I agree with all of what has been said. Um, and something that was asked, and I experienced this, or I read this on Twitter, I have had discussion with colleagues and experienced this myself. Some people take multiple roles when they work with an esports. Um, they do the job of a sports psychologist and a performance coach, or they become a nutritionist, stuff like that. Um, how do you make sure that your role is set in your contracts or in what you express to the players? And have you worked on other aspects that you usually wouldn't? Maybe uh, Eric or Michelle? Yeah, so... Eric, you want to go first? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, I'll go first now. <laughs> um, so... In before joining a team or working with a team, um, I have to make it very clear, um, most likely um, into a contract, um, what, what the communication is between me, the team, the players, the staff, and also what I can do and what I can't do and what could happen. Because um, like a, a few weeks ago, 
um, a, a, an organization um, asked me to help with the team because it like it, it wasn't performing well and they started to um, there were like two weeks left of competition and the team was like breaking breaking off each other and they wanted to fix it like but it, it was I felt like mm, that's not gonna work because I'm just gonna say out loud what everybody already thinks they don't want to play with each other so you really have to make sure that the coast is clear and that you have a good good feel to work on and that everyone know knows what you're actually doing what what you're not supposed to do yeah and also not capable of in, in terms of um, strictly saying what's sport psychology and what's what's like um um like a therapist thing right thank you michelle i yes. want to take a little slightly different aspect um i want to talk about uh, i've never had a contract actually i've never signed a contract um I, i'm taken on board by organizations to make their players better and if i don't make them better then i get sacked um so i don't often get sacked <laughs> um and the second one I wanted to make, a uh, point I wanted to make was, I've forgotten, um, gosh, Eric, it was something that you just said. Uh, oh, I've forgotten. Old age. <laughs> so good for memory. What were you talking about, Eric? Give me a reminder. What did you just say? Uh, what part are you referring to? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, oh, I don't know. It was something you said, like, towards the end there. Um, it's like oh, the, the 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 spot psychology and the um and ah, the, confidentiality the... thank you Eric. you reminded me thank you so a lot of a lot of the stuff that's um that's where in, you you want to be very clear is to so when i'm working in discord uh, with all my esports teams i say to them okay in the team channel you know nothing goes anywhere obviously i have a psych channel and when i'm working with a team this is you know where the team and i interact as a group and then, of course, I can see and I, I can talk to them individually and I tell them that, you know, anything that's between an individual player and myself, totally confidential. And that um, that sort of helps sort of draw the line for them as to say, okay, well, what can I tell her um, about, you know, my performance issues or whatever else? So that's important. That's important to sort of get straight immediately. And then, and then I... The reason, well, I guess the reason I don't have a contract or I'm happy to work that way is that the org trusts me to do the very best for their teams. And so that, you know, the team is very keen to hear, you know, what are you a spy for the, for the, for the managers and the org owners a bit higher up? And I'm saying, no, no, I'm here for you, but they've invested their time and money in me. And my job is to make you better. So, uh, I don't I don't take stuff back to them and say, oh, guess what so and so said. I say, you know, we have a problem here and maybe I have to call in another expert who can help help fix this if it's if I can't. But um generally I can. So um you're just working out, you know, where the roles, the demarcation of roles is and and how that affects confidentiality. That's something that's really important to set out. Yeah. I think this is what John recently stressed about that we set clear boundaries what we do what we don't do and and set our role in a clear way um there is something that i want to address and don't leave it as it has been said so i understand that teams hire sport psychologists or every other role within esports to make sure performance is increasing but um i think it's difficult to even though we expect us doing a great job and given that we work on certain issues such as performance anxiety, tilt, or team dynamics, that performance would in increase over the course of time. But I think we can't promise that. Or you, yeah. Have you ever experienced an issue in that, Michelle? That, for example, um, well, I see, performance I see there's decreased? Two, two factors. So, yes, we want performance to increase, but also we want enjoyment and longevity to, to stick around, you know, to stick around as a team. And that's how I also know whether I'm working or not. You know, the team may not be performing at the level we want to right at the moment, but we're we're sticking together as a team and we're working together as a team and success will come as a result of that. So 
Uh, I don't often have teams that sort of break apart. Uh, we, we work very cl closely together to make sure that doesn't happen. So, um, that, you know, team, teams breaking apart is, is, a, is a problem because orgs spend a lot of money on players and to keep churning through them, it's expensive and time, it's a waste of time for teams. They get held back from not progressing very fast. So if we can sort of fix up, you know, minimise the turnover of players, then that's going to help performance in the long run as well. I think this also comes back to setting your role and, and depends on the duration of your contract. Yeah. Um, you want to add something, John, I think. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. <clears throat> so just coming back to your first question of like, do you do anything else than just like psychology? Me, on my side, absolutely not. I only focus on psychology. That's what I'm trained for. That's what I'm competent for. That's, that's what I'm qualified for. Um, and I think... If there, there are things that pop up that are beyond your com competencies, I think it's your responsibility as a practitioner to develop a wide network of professionals, such as nutritionists, physical therapists, SNC coaches. Uh, yeah, really have referral networks available to you in the case there is something that pops up. I think as practitioners, it's our due diligence to have this. And if you don't, I think it's important that you do. Um, I think role clarity is a topical issue in esports at the minute, you know, with the performance coach sort of term. But I I strongly believe that you should do no harm and do what you're qualified and competent to do. So it might be controversial, but that's sort of how I've sort of been trained. So mm. yeah. Do no harm. That's the motto. I think it's perfect approach. And and the only, I don't know. Um, yeah, so we have a question in the chat that I would, um, just slide in is does negative reinforcement in your opinion, have a place in esports? Who wants to answer that question? I think it can be damaging for teams to do that. Uh, so I, I just, I advise not to. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Okay. So I think John also agrees. Thank you for that. Um, I hope it answers your question. Um, otherwise, we frame it and put it in the chat again. Um, we are running out of time, so we have 20 minutes left. I think um, we have to move on a little bit. So John, it's it's your turn now. Given that I want to get back to a presentation you provided um, at the ERN conference in Tjernköping, Sweden last year. And you presented, I think, about sports psychologists' perspectives or experience of working in esports. So everything we discussed so far, um, how does it differ from what you presented? Or is it, yeah. So I guess the sort of title was uh, uh, like traditional sports, uh, sports psychologists transitioning in, into esports or so working into esports. So a lot of what we talked about today was kind of covered was also mentioned or popped up in that study um so yeah i found a, a variety of different themes i'm currently working on right now but um but one thing that was really interesting to me was that practitioners tended to have some like assumptions about the field and the, the people they were going to work with before entering esports um but after they recognized that it's really important to challenge these assumptions um because it's obviously going to impact the way you view how you practice and how. What, what you... sort of assumptions, John? What sort of assumptions do they have? Hundred percent. So the typical image of a gamer, you know, potentially being overweight, uh, not really taking care of their physical health, etc. Whereas the reality is, okay, there might be this, but I think esports is moving away to that towards that, moving away from that sort of image. There are a lot of players that actually care about their health and that love going to the gym is sort of like a, a new wave. Um, so mostly about that kind of aspect and yeah, and potentially not being so open to the services, for psychology services. Um, so, and obviously all of these assumptions as practitioners, as we know, sort of influence the way we practice. So that was an interesting theme that sort of popped out. Then there was that sort of lack of collaboration. Um, so I've talked about this because I've experienced it firsthand. So um, 
so when orgs tended to hire someone it was more of like the case of okay you're the expert you're the sports psych you do what you have to do whereas in reality we need org leaders to be able to do our job effectively we need to work in this like multidisciplinary way um, we need to be aware of you know organized like org changes uh, roster changes these are small details that majorly impact our work as practitioners and um yeah sort of the practitioners that i interviewed experienced a sort of lack of collaboration um what else there was sort of them we might come to it later i'll save it for later Oli. um yeah that gaining entry so transitioning to pioneer um there's also that financial aspect that um, was attractive to practitioners um and obviously their passion for gaming um what else oh yeah there was the sacrifices and commitment required to work in esports especially full-time so a lot of practitioners have to well especially when you work full-time you have to sort of move abroad for example in berlin being a hub of esports that's something that practitioners face difficulties with if they wanted to provide their services in person um the schedules as well being esports being quite a, a late night uh activity um so practitioners struggled with that um the travel required so there's that self-care piece um to manage so, sort of work-life balance so in, so some practitioners explain that they would come very early in the mornings to, to the office and leave very late at night so that unstructured um schedules yeah a lot a lot to talk about um yeah. What else? Thank, thank you so far for that description. Um, did they say something about the experience of or about esports? Um, Some, if they, if you, uh, work with CS:GO players but never played CS:GO on a certain level, did they yeah. mention that? Yes. So this was what I was going to talk about. Was they? A lot of them wish that they took more of a proactive role whilst entering the space. So taking the steps to understand the context a bit better, the nuances between traditional sports and esports. So things that might pop up is like the frequent updates, the patches and how that impacts, you know, performance, for example. There's the language, obviously. Um, for example, we talked about today, we mentioned comms, you know, some practitioners didn't even know what that meant um, when they just transitioned. So yes, a lot of all of these things that they had to consider um, when coming into the space. Um, yeah okay um michelle you i think you were approached by the condor performance or whatever well they, they were they were um traditional sport um ah. company okay. so i was approached by chiefs um esports who is a very large organization in oce and started working with them and i, I worked with them in the, like the traditional way of being called in when things went wrong and or did like weekly sessions with them and that worked fine it was okay but uh when I worked out that there was actually discord and I could actually listen to matches live and um I changed my approach totally so I think I worked with teams in a totally different way to I haven't heard of any any sports psychologists esports like working in the same way I do where I sit in on scrims and officials like I'm I'm welcome to come and listen to a team anytime. Um and I, I listen to all their screams or as many as I can or record them for them. And so I'm I'm highly embedded in my teams. Yeah. And it, it just I just worked in a different way, I think. So So there was no issue about your background in esports, though your ex I'd say lack of experience and sorry about that. Um Well, no no, but that as well as being female is it can often be something that works against mm. me. I mean, I've, I've had teams say I don't want someone in in Discord that sound, you know, that looks and sound like my mother. <laughs> um and that's okay that I don't have to work with those teams. That's fine. That's their mm. choice. Yeah. But and your choice um, as well. And, and, yeah, and the, uh, but the org the org knows how I want to work and they ask the players and if the players accept and say yes we want to be the best we'll we'll listen to what she says yeah so. and related to this aspect is there something that you would recommend um practitioners that are thinking thinking about entering esports it's definitely one way that they should think about but it's an expensive way if you're a young person like um you know if you're building up your career it's probably not feasible to do 
the way I do it right at the moment. Um, you, you have to earn a living and you probably can't do that in esports, right? You know, if you're a young person with a family, lots of financial commitments, whereas I can do it because I'm nearly retired. Yeah. So it's just a totally different aspect. Yeah. And in terms of the esports specific language, is, is there something, maybe a question to all of you, uh, how to ease the first steps in the esports environment if you lack um, knowledge about the specific game? I had I had um, Urban Dictionary on speed dial oh. on my on my web page, looking up words constantly to see what my players were talking about because I didn't understand when I first started, but because I listen to them all the time now, it's just second nature. I, I speak esports as well these days. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a really big step to get into the field. Um, uh, I had I've seen several surveys from peers and pop psychologists who ask around. Um, they wanted to quantify if the sport psychologists are actually useful for esports players. And there was a really positive reaction from other players. But the number one criticism was like the language barrier. <laughs> it's not like they don't speak the same language. But as we just said, it's like if you don't um, speak esports, then you may not be of this kind of help because they don't understand the 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 problems there that that the players are in so i i would say you just have to get into the sport and play play some games and maybe have maybe have a child um and play with them for example that might be of a, a bit of help have a get get yourself a coach <laughs> Get a self coach and a child before. <laughs> <It's really laughs> fun. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think asking questions as well, asking you know the players, the coaches, mm -hmm. the staff. I think not being afraid to ask questions is a really good approach as well. I think if you show that you've put some effort in to try to understand the context and language, etc., I think any questions that you have, they'll be happy to to answer. Yeah. Other things. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned openness as something you value and you experience as a pleasant in esports yeah so it's it can be a challenge i think to summarize this this aspect it can be a challenge but it's not nothing that should avoid entering esports okay um the one thing i wanted to add there because like i thought we we looked um, at this question from the perspective of a sport psychologist that um has always already has been practitioner for several years but for for a person that is just coming up like um, maybe studying in university right now. Um, I wanted to add two things. A a academic proficiency is maybe one big step because I've encountered several people who had, yeah, well, nothing to, to maybe a little bit profic proficiency. And uh, they said, yeah, well, I'm the medical for this and that team. And I was really scared. Uh, sometimes I was, I was scared about the players because um, they they had bad experiences with mental coaches. So I I just hate this this word. But in in esports, everyone says, hey, "Well, we need a mental coach." They understand a men what a mental coach is. But if, we, if you say you're a sport psychologist, they they don't get that really. So um, make make yourself distinct from mental coaches. I think that's a big big step. Um, and um, the other thing I want to say is that also what what does a mental coach or a sport psychologist coach is like um, is that the the question about sport and exercise psychology, sport psychology, performance coach? Maybe some people think nutrition is always a part of the performance coach, but um, myself as a sport psychologist, I don't have anything to do with nutrition. I'm not trained that at all. Um, so look out. For for what you're doing and what you can do and what you're not supposed to. Thank you so much for adding uh, that perspective as well, uh, as we didn't, as I didn't address it. Um, interrupt me if you wanted to say something, otherwise I continue. Um, we, we had one question from the chat um, and thank you for that. If you could give a piece of advice to coaches in general, what would it be? So do you have a tip or do you have a recommendation for coaches? 
based on your experience? Um, li- listen, listen to the sports psychologist. <laughs> um, some of my best work has been done with coaches. Uh, it's it's easy, especially if you're coming into a, a long-standing team with a coach, uh, to work with a coach to frame to allow them to frame their messages to the team because they've got ready access to the team and they they know the language and they know what their players are like. But if I can work with a coach and help them be more effective, then the message gets across even better. Yeah, hundred percent agree, John. I completely agree. I, that's, that's the point I was going to touch upon. It's like we're not replacing the coach's role. We, yes. It's not at all that. Sports psychology isn't about that. It's using our knowledge and sort of empowering you and, you know, for you to de- develop these mental skills and mental tools that you can then apply with the players. So I think a lot of resistance can be sort of done because of this misunderstanding. So fantastic point, Michelle. I'm just going to silently note this. Okay. <laughs> and do we or do you have any recommendations or piece of advice for players that are interested or currently work with both psychologists? That, that really work right with them or maybe they don't work with them. Um, if, you've got, if you've got people out there who are listening that, that want to um, learn more about sports psychology, Follow, follow us because we all tweet good stuff. So um, I, I would make that recommendation now. I confirm this recommendation. Yes. <laughs> um, if, if, hmm. I think, I think, as practitioners, we I always imagine like have like a magic, not really a magic, but a bag of tricks. And when a, an issue comes up, I I create like thirty minute interventions or descriptions of an issue and how to fix it and I might do that as a presentation with my team so 30 minutes is not too much to ask for and I have it on a range of topics so I can easily put you know reach into my bag pull out a topic give a talk to my team and help them fix an issue maybe that they're experiencing at the moment or maybe something I expect them to have a problem with later on and it just means I'm preparing, mentally preparing them for stuff all the time. So if you're uh, thinking about becoming a practitioner in esports, even in sports psychology, have a bag of tricks of things that you can pull out at a moment's notice that you can teach people um, how, how to be better. Yeah. Um, um, I call that my toolbox and I'm constantly trying to um, fill it with good stuff, with uh some some new things I find in books, but or or sometimes I snatch something from someone else. <laughs> um, sometimes I try to convert uh, things I saw in traditional sports and try to convert them into esports and see how that goes. Um, and yeah, it's it's filling up more and more, and it's it's really fun to just test out new stuff. I think. Yeah. Thanks. John? Sorry, I'm just going to, I'm just going to extend a little bit more. Sorry, I have to interrupt you, John. No, no. Um, I think it's important as practitioners too, especially people who are trained in sports psychology, to read research papers and to see how to apply the information. You know, it, like like the like the slides that I've shown a bit earlier. You know, how can you actually use this at a practical level? Because all the research in the world, if it doesn't get to coaches or players in a simplified way. You know, you you need that. You know, how do I actually how do I actually put this into practice? And so, just having a simple slide like this where you can talk about things or present information, it's usually a bit complex, but in a simple way, that's that's going to benefit everybody the most, I think. Yeah, I sorry agree. to interrupt. No, you uh, didn't. <laughs> Um, if so, I think the question was if you have a tips for players, was it? Yeah. I think mm-hmm. don't be discouraged if you have like a bad experience with like a sports psychologist. Everyone has a different approach, a different way of working. So I really encourage you to not sort of shut it down if you have a negative experience with it. Um, there's thousands of sports psychologists on this planet with all different approaches, styles that may suit you. So I think give it give it a chance. Um, 
is maybe my advice if you do have like a negative experience with it. Mm. And I, it's I funny because think... in, in my region, I have, we only have two. <laughs> There's myself and some other guy. Oh, wow. Maybe I went over the top with the thousands. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think so too. It's maybe a handful. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe my next comment doesn't apply to your area, uh, Michelle. But I okay. wanted to say once players get in contact with a sport psychologist or any other personal sport performance coach, if they don't feel comfortable with the person in the first meeting, they don't experience the person being warm, or sympathetic, or being able to trust them, then they should search for a different person because you need to be able to talk openly about um, yeah, negative aspects that you are not happy always to share or that's not easy to share at all points in time. Okay, so we're getting to the end and I would like to ask one last question um, before we close this brilliant session, uh, there were different aspects that I would to go into more detail too, but yeah, time is limited. Um, so the last question is, what are your recommendations for sport psychologists to sum it up? Are there any besides just try it, go for the financial aspects, go for this and that? Financial aspects were just a joke. Don't worry. So, um, Michelle, you're still unmuted. Would you like to start? Uh, yeah, so let me think. Um, I, I expect to be learning new stuff all the time. So expect to learn and add to your repertoire as you go on. Make sure you're networking with other people. So, again, don't limit yourself to single views, you know, single viewers of you know, topics that you like, expose yourself to a whole range of different views so you can see what else you want to pick out and, and maybe use. I would recommend getting some mentors. So I have a number of people who uh, are my mentors and they, they help me in different ways in my business, sort of being a better sports psychologist, presenting myself in a different way. Um, I, I guess one of the one of the good tips that one of them gave me was, you know, make yourself visible because a lot of sports psychology is invisible. It's behind the scenes and, you, you know, for issues of confidentiality, you don't want everything to be known. But in your team channel, you should be sort of showing how you're adding value so that the org that you're working for knows your value and understands why they're paying you that money. So that's really important. That was a really good tip that I got. Um, I was also told not to share that one, but never mind. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think I think they're you know, I, I'm I'm someone that does what it takes, and so just be prepared to do different roles. Um, you know, do, I, I'm I, like I OBS my my matches, my team's matches, and I um, create spreadsheets and I do statistical analysis a little bit too. So. All those sort of things. Be a jack of all trades because in orgs, you know, they don't have a lot of money to spend, I find. So you, if you say, you know, I'm only going to be doing this, you might be cutting yourself out of some jobs. Yeah. So be prepared to be hands-on and in there. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add something to that, Eric or John? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I would say for practitioners especially, you just have to, you just have to feel it. So if you if you're in esports and you just don't enjoy the the mi the micro actions that the players are like capable of and what that converts into in, in the game, if you don't enjoy that, um, you you might not be a able to um, help them properly yeah. because you don't get on the same wavelength. And I think that's what um, many practitioners experienced. Um, I've heard from some colleagues that there are um, many sport psychologists uh, that are working with um, eSport athletes that just don't enjoy them, just, just don't enjoy working with them. They said like, nah, th those are not athletes. And I think that's very harmful f for, for both sides. And so get in or get out, <laughs> but don't stay in between. <laughs> Thank you. One thing we didn't mention was uh was like when I just entered the space was being getting used to players not wanting to put their cameras on. That's something I really I really struggled with at the start because I was very used to seeing traditional sports athletes, you know, their body language. If 
And it's really useful for our role as practitioners to know if our points are landing, if you know, how, how the client is responding to your points, et cetera. So I think being pre just prepared for that and also encouraging the players to potentially turn their cameras on and to, and to explain to them that by doing so, your work is going to be more impactful and more helpful, I guess. Um, so I think don't be afraid of that. But yeah, that's something I had to sort of learn with coming into the space. So that's a little recommendation. I think also being flexible. Esports yeah. is a like fast paced, you know, environment. So being flexible as a practitioner, adaptable is really important. I'm going to steal this anecdote from a participant in my study. They explained that, for example, they had prepared a session, they were about to do it, and then five minutes later, it got cut short because the team had uh, like media media to do. So just being prepared for these instances and sort of regulating your own emotions when it does happen is really important. Um, but yeah, I think and one last recommendation for like orgs, I think is really important to mention. Make sure who you're hiring is qualified and has the competence to be able to do the job effectively. So, for example, sports psychologists look at their qualifications and their background. You know, we need to create a professional standard in esports. I think it's very much needed. So, I think that would be one for orgs and for parents of players if you're working individually. I think as well, um, and players themselves if they can. But a huge one, I think. Thank you so much for for your insights. Um, to briefly sum it up. Your recommendations for sports psychologists or other people that you know, certainly touch on those areas um, they should be open to learn they should be uh, flexible in doing their their job they should enjoy it they should make sure to provide competent and professional standards they should also benefit from networks or getting mentors make sure to make themselves visible and on the other side, be okay with players not being visible via camera and having their certain behaviors, which is it's fine. And introduce yourself, set uh, set clear expectations about your service and set your role in a clear, precise way. So that's it for today. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't address everything in detail. I really enjoyed the session. Just one last aspect out of self-advertisement. Uh, coming in soon in the Journal of Electronic Games and Esports is a paper that addresses stress management strategies in esports. Uh, a paper by myself, Matthew Watson, Laura Swettenham, Ismail Pedraza Ramirez, and the uh, two latest uh, co authors are also present in today's talk, and Franziska Lautenbach. So if you're interested in what strategies the individuals we um, provided with surveys, do to support players before and after competition. This will be coming out soon. Enough of that. Thank you very much, Michelle, Eric, and John, for your time. Thanks to the audience for listening. Um, I had a blast hosting this session. It was was so nice. Um, do you have any last words? Thank you for organizing it. It's great to be able to speak about practice um, and and trying to improve that sort of area. Thank you very much. Yeah, Th thank you um, as well from me, Oliver. Thanks for having us, and um, good luck in ranked um, or whatever <laughs> you're playing. And uh, see you, see you soon on the on the internet. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you, Shun, as we say. <laughs> Appreciate. it. <laughs> Gerne geschehen. Thanks yeah. everyone for watching. <laughs> Have a nice day and goodbye. Goodbye, guys.